Welcome back to the Present Fathers Podcast. My guest in this episode is Seth Gale. Seth is first and foremost a husband and father. Seth is also a multi-talented athlete who excels at ultramarathon running, Brazilian jiu-jitsu. He is an army veteran, and he is now a speaker and author. Despite facing a tumultuous upbringing full of adversity and hardship, he has risen as a powerful advocate for resilience and self-empowerment. As a speaker, he inspires others to harness their inner strength and overcome life's challenges with unwavering determination. In this episode, Seth shares his brutal and challenging story. It is hard to listen to at times, but I encourage you to dive in and gain the lessons that he is willing to share through his painful experience. Seth leads with a great deal of courage in this episode, sharing what is an incredibly painful experience, but offering healing and advice to those who need it. Seth is an inspiration, simply put. There's no other way to say it. I am so honored that he joined us for this episode, and I am so touched by his presence on this show to share his heart with all of you, our dear listeners. Seth wants you to rise above your challenges and overcome the shadows. Please welcome the one and only Seth Gale to the Present Fathers Podcast. Welcome back to the Present Fathers Podcast. This is a special episode back in studio with Seth Gale. Seth is uh, going to share his story today, and I'm just going to kind of warn the listeners right now, this one is going to be kind of tough to listen to, but it's extremely important to listen to. And uh, Seth, I want to just thank you up front for having the courage to do what you're doing, sharing your story and giving hope to those who have been through similar struggles. And so before we get into the heavy things first, why don't you introduce yourself to the audience? Tell us a little bit, a little about who you are, your family, where you come from, and we'll get into your story. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm a born and raised Ohioan, so I'm a Buckeye. Um, but, uh, okay, we're gonna have to end the episode now. <laughs> Go Ducks. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm a Buckeye, a uh, diehard, diehard Buckeye fan, but um, yeah, I joined the army when I was like, uh, I don't know, 17 or 18, 17. I was in high school still, um, did the army thing for about eight years. Uh, I was in the infantry, uh, stationed Fort Stewart initially, then went to 82nd, uh, at Fort Bragg. And then, um, that's where I met, or I met my wife in Georgia. Once I got out of the army, we came back to Georgia. Okay. Uh, we live in the Atlanta area now and got two kids, a little five-year-old and three-year-old that keep me going every day. <laughs> um, and I, you know, my daily life is basically gym, work, jujitsu, running. Uh, I've been doing some ultra marathons. I've got another one I'm training for nice. in June. So that'll be a 48 hour race. See how long I go. Yeah. That's, that's a long time to run. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But uh, so that's kind of what I'm doing now. And, the, and, and I'm also writing a book that, that should be out later this year. Um, public speaking, public podcasting. Speaking, yeah, podcasting, public speaking. I'm on like my world tour era right now, <laughs> just freaking traveling, speaking, telling my story. And it's been like incredible. The feedback, the story is deep <clears throat> and mm -hmm. it's hard to listen to. <clears throat> and I get a lot of credit for the candid way that I tell it. Yeah. Um, it's raw, it's real, it's powerful. And so that's, that's kind of what I'm doing now. Yeah, man. Well, to that end, um, yeah, it really starts very early in your story, from what I understand. So, um, tell us a little bit about the upbringing, your situation, you know, single mom situation, right, and uh, how the abuse started. Yeah, so I yeah, I grew up with a single mother, three kids were were in my house as me and my two sisters, and. Um, so the whole single mother thing came about from having us at a young age, basically. Okay. I think she had us at like 17, 18, 19, okay. or 16, 17, 18, something like that. Really, really young. And back-to-back -back years. Like me and my older sister are 11 months apart. Me oh, and my okay. younger sister are like 13 months apart. Wow. And um, my older sister is my only natural sibling. My younger sister, we have different parents. My brother, we have different uh, mothers as as well. Okay. So. Um, but yeah, my, my mom, we were all in the house at a young age. I think I was maybe one or two and my, my father and my mom got into a fight and he stabbed her behind the ear and almost killed her. And Whoa. yeah, so he went to prison for that. Um, so I never knew my father growing up. <clears throat> um, I don't know. I don't remember that day. I was way too young to remember. I, was, I think I was probably two or three years old when that happened. So I don't remember that happening. I just have been told stories of mm -hmm. it happening. Yeah. And and it's a he said, she said between the two of them. Um, 
as many times as I've told my story, I always like say it's like very normal, but this was just not a normal childhood. Right. I was, uh, you know, we bounced around a lot. My mom couldn't take care of us a lot. We would live with like random friends and people a lot. I, I remember living with just different people. And, and when that happens, children become very vulnerable. Yeah. And they're very susceptible to different things. When you're a single parent household, your children are already like extremely vulnerable to these yeah. things, you know? So, um, yeah, my, my mom, I remember she would take us to this, this one house and there was a bunch of kids in that house. I do remember that house pretty profoundly, I guess, but there was a guy who was, he was like a teenager. He's like 15, 16, 17. And I was about five okay. and he would take me to his, um, bed, his bed at night. I just remember it being dark. Like it was always, it was always at night. And um, that wasn't anything crazy. I think the majority of that was, like, exposing himself to me mm. and then sometimes, like, just making me touch him or, like, kind of showing me, like, mm. like his his uh, privates or whatever. And I, I, like, I so, like, distinctly remember that. It's almost like a dream, almost like it didn't happen. I know it happened because we, we, we did tell my grandparents about that okay. when I was that young. And I don't remember that conversation either, but my grandparents do. They remember us coming to them and telling them that that um you know this guy was doing this to me yeah and so and then what happened I don't really know I think they tried to they tried to like save us they tried to report it unfortunately with the with the laws and the way that the government is and CPS and all this they can know a child is being abused they, you can walk into a house you can see drugs on the table and you can't do anything about it you can't take the kids you know there's like so much to it it's so hard to take kids from a parent it's crazy. Um, and, 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 you know, and you see it because you can drive to the yeah. worst neighborhoods sure. and you can go to any one of those houses and you can see the living conditions, but you can't take the kids. It does not, it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter. You can't take them. So that's kind of what happened when I was young, I think. And not right. that my living condition was terrible, but it was not ideal. And unfortunately, nothing happened basically Okay. with, with that. So you were still <clears throat> like going over there or? Yeah. Yeah. So I, I, I. I don't remember how many times that happened. That, that was like maybe a handful of times. I think maybe once once we said something, maybe it stopped. Maybe mm -hmm. they said something to him. But that guy actually, he's actually in prison now, I think, or he went to prison for quite a long time for, um, he ended up raping a girl that was next door who was uh, really young when he was like 18 or 20 or something like that. He ended up raping the girl that was next door. Um, and so, you know. It, right. Yeah. Obviously the signs were there. Yeah, exactly. Um, when we were talking before starting, you had told me too, that you were exposed to like pornography and all kinds of yep. stuff like that very early on, like five years old. Yeah. Can you talk about just, you know, that's, a, that seems extremely young, just straight up, but you, you sound like you have a level of clarity about how distorted your view of life was even that young. Can you just talk about where you were kind of mentally? Yes. At least so, from what you can remember, rather. Yeah. So, <clears throat> um, I will say it is very hard to remember a lot of these things when you grow up with like a traumatic life. It's it's really sad. I, I can't remember a lot of my childhood. Mm. So I have to like very like when I journal or write my book, I I sometimes I'll come across things and I'm like, oh man, I forgot all about that, and then I'll you know. So, anyways, to your point, yeah, when I was in kindergarten, first grade ish, we were my mom would work all day. And so we would wake up in the morning, go to school. And this is back in the day when you could like walk to school without right. getting kidnapped. Sure. So we'd walk to school, walk home. And I remember we found my mom's like porn collection or whatever that was in the house. And we, um, um, we would take it outside and show the neighborhood kids. We'd play it in the house. Mm. There was like DVDs and VHSs, whatever. And we'd play it and watch it. And we thought it was funny and all this yeah. stuff. Uh, but it, but it really messes you up. And you don't realize it at the time. And it took me a long time to realize that that yeah. that, that was happening. You know, that that I was doing, like, wrong things and, like, how much it did really mess me up as, a, as an adult. Yeah. And so, for reference, like, when I was in that same time, kindergarten, first grade, because I had seen these videos, I had a – there was a girl in this neighborhood that I really liked. And I think she was maybe a year older than me or same age-ish. And we went into my closet and, like, I was trying to have sex with this girl. At mm. five, six years old, maybe. Because you'd seen it? Yeah. I was like, yeah, I, I know what to do. Like, this is what you're supposed to do. And so we're, like, in my closet, 
And I remember my mom opens the door up and she's like, what are y'all doing? And I'm like, nothing. My mom asks the girl, y'all trying to have sex? And the girl says, yes. And so my mom yanks me out the closet, beats my ass and rightfully so. But <clears throat> with that, you know, uh, I was just doing what I'd seen. Right. And, and, and so the combination of the, like the porn and I don't remember if this was before or after that guy had mm-hmm. molested me um, already. So I can't remember, but it was about the same time, same time frame, uh, definitely within a year or two of each other. And so th- those things really, you know, they, they jacked me up more than I realized. Mm. It's probably yeah. still now. So. Yeah. Um, well, and then you have like <clears throat> the shame of it too, right? Cause you got in trouble and all that kind of stuff. So then you just, it, you know, it, it, it's like this spiral that just keeps going. And, um, yeah, that's a very young age to be exposed to those things and have to wrestle with those things. Um, from what I understand, things got worse, yes. right? So, yeah. So, so, you know, growing up like six, seven, eight years old, my father was never there. He was, he was still in prison for all this time. My first actual like, memory of meeting my father i have pictures of when i was a baby with him mm. but my first memory of like being with my father is in prison and and like I, I walk i remember we were gonna go see my dad this day and i was like seven seven or eight and i'm like i'm super excited i'm like yeah we're right. gonna meet dad and it's not like not to go play baseball it's like because dad's in prison and this is the only place we can go see him and i'm walking in there's like a there's some cubicles and i can see all the guys and they're in like their their jumpsuits, right? And I know my dad as soon as I see him, and I don't know how I know who he is. My I don't hmm. I don't know how I realize that, you know. But I I knew he was my dad as soon as I saw him. Okay. And my dad looks like a convict. Like he's he looks he's got jacked up hands, like big jacked up knuckles. He's got finger tattoos. He's got Ozzy tattooed across his knuckles and all these prison tats on his arms. He's got um, pain and uh, br- big like. Uh, block graffiti letters tattooed across his throat mm. he's got a skull tattooed on the back of his head and he's bald um and he just looks tired you know he looks like a worn out person yeah. and so I, m- I remember seeing him and uh there's like a black telephone there that you can talk through the po- right. po- plexiglass right. you know and i grab it and he sits down and he's like looking at me just like this and he smiles at me and he's he's, he's happy to see me you know yeah. he's happy to see his kids and i just fell apart like, I couldn't even talk to him. And, you know, that was really tough because, uh, you know, being a father now, you don't realize um, how powerful that is, man. Like, mm. I – sometimes I'll see people that are good fathers and I'll see them with their kids and I'm just like, man, I wish I could have had that. Right. And even when I'm a father now, like, the things that I do with my kids, I, I always get very emotional about it because it's it's just hard – when that's your first experience with your father or seeing him in prison and my life could have been so much more different if I would just had a father in my life. And, um, yeah, I remember he said something to me like, hi. And and I was so excited, but I couldn't talk. I just fell apart, started crying. Couldn't, couldn't keep myself together. My sisters talked to him for a few minutes and I just sat there and cried and cried and cried. And, um, yeah, that was really tough. So that was meeting my father and, I think he got out around like the time I was eight or nine or so. And I would occasionally see him from time to time. It was almost like the random person you see at Walmart every now and then. Okay. Like, yeah. Like the person you bump into town around. You yeah. Know. You know, it's the person you bump, bump into yeah. around town, you know, it's like, Oh, Hey, how you doing? You know, we always see each other for some reason. So th- that's kind of how like my relationship with my father was from there on. Okay. Kind of barely saw him every now and then. And uh, he just, he was an alcoholic and just continued to get in trouble and continued to do dumb shit and just, you know, just, he, he never got his life together, mm-hmm. unfortunately. So never got to really experience that. Uh, despite all of that, every time I did hang out with him, the few times we did, like, I always looked at him like, like, I was, I, I was still proud that he was my father. Yeah. And it's kind of another funny story is like, I was hanging out with him one day. And he was showing me a meal that they cooked in prison. Okay. And like that's so, so you may have played baseball with your father. I made this like prison meal with my father. Mm. Like that was our bonding moment, wow. you know, which yeah. is, you know, to put things in perspective, it's, it's like, wow. Yeah, it's definitely 
yeah. not ideal. Yeah, and it was like ramen noodles, a bag of Doritos, some mayonnaise, hot sauce, and mustard. You like bunch it all up, and I'm sitting here eating it with my dad, and that was like a cool moment. Mm. You know, uh, it's kind of interesting thinking about like the different places that you'll come from, right. where people can come from. So, um, yeah, so that 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 was like my fatherhood father relationship, and then with my mom. When I was when I was about ten years old, things kind of started to get really bad. She'd always had boyfriends throughout the years. Okay, just different random guys coming in and out of the house, and she was dating this guy for quite a while, who was pretty cool dude for the most part, as far as I remember. But when I was ten, we were in this house, and this was like a very like pivotal point in our life. Uh, this one house, like a lot of bad things happened here, and my mom got to the point where she would work at night and be with us during the day. So we'd get okay. home from school, uh, maybe six, seven, eight o'clock at night. She'd go to work at a factory. She'd work 12 hour shifts. Okay. So imagine leaving your nine, 10, 11 year old kids at home every single night right. for 12 hours. Um, I don't know why she did that. All I can, all I can attribute it to maybe the job situation was forcing it on her. But to me, it, it almost feels like a lack of responsibility just because if she would have worked during the day, she'd right. have to be with us at night, and then she'd have to be there to take care of us. So you think she was kind of running from it? Yeah, I think she wanted to work at night and 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 be an adult or be who whoever the hell she wanted to be during the day. Because okay. during the day, she you know we were at school, so she could yeah. be with her friends. She could she didn't have anything to do, you know. So I think maybe she was like maybe running from it, mm. and and I I, I want to say I don't blame her. Because she was a single mother of three, like, I can understand, like, that's probably very hard to do. Right. But on the same token, you know, you got to realize, like, these are your kids. Yeah. You can't do this to your kids. And so that's the part where it's like, I can't, I can't let that go. So when I was about 10, though, that's when things shifted and she became, you know, more abusive. Um, like she, f- physically yeah, abusive? Yeah, physically, okay. emotionally. Like, the physical things are, are tough. And there's there was a time where... You know, I was I was in my room playing video games, and I'm I'm sitting on my bed, and I'm, I have my back against the wall, and my my sister, my older sister, comes in. She's crying. She's she's mad. She just mm-hmm. got in a fight with my little sister. My older sister sitting right here, right next to me. She's facing me. Her head's against the back. Uh, her head's against the wall too. My door's right here. Okay. Out of nowhere, like my sister's just venting to me. Out of nowhere, my mom kicks the door open, turns, looks at my sister, like hammer fist, punches her in the face. Um. And my sister had a sucker in her mouth. Oh, man. And so, like, that's what actually what scared me initially was I thought she was going to, like, knock choke. her teeth out yeah. or choke or something, you know? And so she, like, hammer fist punches her. I remember seeing my sister's head, like, snap back against the wall, hits her two or three more times. And when she did that, I jumped on the other side of my bed. I was terrified, you know? Yeah. Like, this is the first time that I can remember my mom, like, closed fist swinging on her kids. Mm. And I remember being on the other side of my bed, like, looking at my mom, and she looks at me... At 10 years old, she tells me, she's like, stop being a little bitch before I give you something to cry about. Wow. And this is all I got. Like, this is my protector. This is right. my, this is, uh, th- you are the only person I have in this world. And 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 for you to sit here and tell me to, you know, d- to yell at me like that after you just beat the hell out of my sister, that was really hard. Yeah. Um, You know, a few weeks later, I walked home from school and... I, I, me and my cousins had spent more time walking home from school than we should have. We should, we weren't supposed to walk anyways. We okay. always rode the bus. So my mom was mad that I wasn't home on time. Right. And it wasn't like mad that, oh, I didn't know where you were at. She was just like pissed off that I wasn't home on time. Okay. You know, it wasn't like a, I thought you were missing. It's just it like, it wasn't out of concern. It was like, yes, that's, yeah, yeah that's right. right. It wasn't out of concern. It was like anger. And so because it was like an inconvenience to her, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Yep. Yep. That's exactly right. And so she's like, "Go upstairs. You know, you're getting your ass whooped." And I'm like, "Okay. Yeah. Whatever." So I go upstairs, and she had this paddle. It's like a two by four with like a handle carved into it, and had a bunch of holes. It's like designed for like giving good ass whoopings, basically. And this is what we had been getting whooped with for a while, um, which was not bad, truthfully. But this this day in particular, um, she hit me. And I remember the first time she hit me, I knew, like, this is bad. And I'm, like, stretched out across her bed. I'm, You know, that's what we always had to do. We had to bend over, put our arms out, and, and just hang on, basically. Mm. And she hit me, and I'm like, okay, like, this is not good. 
and she hits me another time and I fell down. Actually, actually hit me so hard I fell to my knees and then she just kept swinging. And so she wasn't hitting me on my ass anymore. She's just striking me across the back with this board. And once again, Dang. like 10 years old. And she hits me probably three, four, five times or so across my back with this board. And I fall down and I'm crying and I, and I crawl to my bedroom and I'm just like torn apart. And the whole, once again, I say the physical things are not that bad. I, I don't think it's, I mean, it is bad to, to get beat by your parents. But when you're, when that happens to you, and like I remember looking up at my mom after that because I was, I was hurting. That shit hurt. Yeah. And uh, she looks at me and says, like, get the fuck out of here. Crawl to your, go to your fucking room is what she says to me. Not like, I love you. This is why I did this. It was it was like malice yeah, coming it, out of her mouth. Yeah. yeah. You know, it was like this very anger, like resentful like tone. It yeah. was so I whoop my kids now. My kids are three and five and they get whoopings, right? Um, but it's not, you know, I've like tapped my son on the butt yeah, and say, it, Hey bud, we it's, can't it's we, correction, it, not it, 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 yes. And there's love. I love my kids so deeply. Right. You know. Where we just didn't get that. And that that is the that is the worst part about it. So the physical things you can heal from. I mean, you're, you, you cut yourself, your, your, your skin will heal. Yeah. The emotional things, man, like that stuff does some damage to you. And even when I tell my story, like sometimes you'll get an older guy that'll comment and say, oh, that was every single day for me. Right. Like tough shit, kid. And it's like, look what's wrong with you. Yeah. Like look at your life and, and, and just assess your life right now. Right. Uh, that's the reason why it's so bad. I, yeah. I'd... Fortunately for me, I turned out to be a pretty decent person, but I still battle every day with these things. Mm. So I know that other people are. Yeah. And I know that it does consume a lot of people, you know. So the emotional scars are really bad. And and when this happened, like my mom started getting more abusive, the emotional things were bad because it was just like not a good place to be. She, she was just very mean. There wasn't a lot of love in the house, you know. Yeah. When I think of like a home, I think of coming home and smelling the spaghetti and the breadsticks and the oven and like the table set and you got the bread and the butter and like we're going to sit down and like have dinner. Like that's what I think about when I think of home. Yeah. Never experienced There's that. There's like a sense of peace. Yeah. Never. I Re never. Restfulness and yeah, like, safety and. Right. You can come yeah. home and like put your stuff down and right. like whatever. Kick, kick your, your shoes up. off. Yep. Yeah. And we never had that. Like I, I, it was like come home and like you're just on edge the whole yeah. freaking time. Like you don't know what's going to happen. And I would come home, and at 10 years old, I, I remember seeing my my mom smoking weed um, with my sister, mm. you know, and all her friends. And my sister would have been 11, no older than 12, smoking weed with a bunch of adults. And they're all passing a bottle of liquor mm. around. And and um, I always knew that would never happen to me. You know, I always knew that I'd be something special in the world. And, and I remember seeing that and thinking to myself, like, nope, that'll never be me. Yeah. And um, about— where, where do you think that came from? That so, yeah, I don't know. I think, I think that that intestinal fortitude, resiliency. I do think it's a, a it's a you have it or you don't. But if you don't have it, you can still build it. It's okay. still a skill that you can acquire. I think it was just one of those things that I naturally came across somehow of this higher, maybe not higher power, but just like this ability, this drive, like yeah. that I had, like. And I'm nothing special, like uh, like, yeah. like you said earlier. You weren't, weren't going to give up, though. Yeah, yeah. you know, I, I wanted to be an Ohio State running back my whole life, and I, I quickly realized, like, once I, <laughs> <laughs> once the muscle wasn't packing on by, like, yeah. 10, it wasn't going to happen. Yeah. You know? Like, I was a very small kid. Same. And, yeah. and uh, I was very small and fragile, and um, I think maybe that, that – that um, ability to be like resilient and like and and mentally tough at that age at ten years old probably came from just being a really good student. I was very smart in school, okay. where I could I could read better than everybody. I was better. I mean, I was no shit the smartest kid in every class. And did you try really hard too, or no, no, wow. And I got perfect grades. I slept through most of my classes. Just played the game. Yeah, just played the game. Scored perfect on tests. I would I would sleep in class on purpose just to get yelled at. And so they would wake so, me and they so you get attention or yeah, potentially. Yeah. Probably mm -hmm. was a call for attention, but I would do it. And the thing was, is like, um, they would, add, they'd write out like the quadratic formula or whatever, sure. right? Some big ass yeah. math problem. And I'd sit there and they'd say, get your notes out. And I'm like, Nope, 
don't need them. And I would do the whole problem in my head. And like faster than everybody else could do on, with a calculator, pen, and pencil. I'd do the whole thing in my head. Wow. And so I, I would do this so that I could show everybody in that room, like, like look at me. I know you all make fun of me. Mm. I know you all think you know who I am, and you think I'm this, like, piece of shit kid. But I'm smarter than everybody in this mm. room. And I, I developed that very quickly. Came to spelling tests, even in, like, you know, second, first, second, third grade. I had this, like, chip on my shoulder that, like, yeah, I don't have a father, and— mm. Um, I don't have these things. I don't have these nice clothes. I don't have the nice crayon box. I don't have like this nice thing, but I'm smarter than everybody in this classroom. Yeah. And I don't even have to try. And I think that's probably what um kind of gave me that inner drive okay. that 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 like I'm better than everybody else around me. And you like you know? wanted to prove it. It's something yeah. to prove. Okay. Yeah. And um yeah, so I was like very, very headstrong, I guess okay. is a good way to put it. And Despite all that, I would end up meeting. So, I have a I, I met a friend who was around the corner from me at this point. He's about um, maybe three, four, five years older than me. Okay, he's like five years older than me. And I'll for the sake of the story, I'll say his name is Jacob just to protect his identity. Okay, but I meet Jacob. Jacob's like five years older than me, and I always had this thing with like hanging out with older kids. Uh, for some reason, I always like found myself with somebody who's like two, three years older, and they're much bigger and stronger. And I was just a very small kid, so like I found these guys that were like protectors, and they could protect me if something happened, you yeah. know. And I didn't have a father, and even even today, I naturally will gravitate towards men mm. in that way of like leadership, and I have a tendency to to follow men, you know. Even when I was in the army, there's leaders in my in my army career that I attach to and they mm. probably don't even realize it, but that it's, it's, I think it's called like having a father wound or something like that. Yeah. There's, there's yeah. like a place in there that you're, you're trying to fill. Mm -hmm. So wherever I go, I find somebody that's like a, a rock. Right. Well, and part of that's natural. Right. And, that, yeah. and that's why, you know, on this show, that's why we harp so heavily on maybe you're not a great, maybe you've made some bad mistakes. Maybe you've really dropped the ball as a dad. Just do your best. Yeah. Because it really does matter in the long run. Because that wound is deep. We we are ingrained and naturally want to have that sense of security and safety from our fathers. And when that's not there, yeah, you're going to go look for it some, somewhere else, some way else. And usually those aren't very productive ways, mm -hmm. uh, you know. So I, I, I feel like you're leading to, yeah. to that exactly right there. So I don't want to yeah, so, foreshadow too much. but Right. Um so I so I I've come across Jacob and me and Jacob start hanging out like every single day. Like okay. I've, he's like my protector. He's like cool as hell. Um, he's like a hero to me. Yeah. You know, he's like this older guy who just best friend. And um, he knows something's wrong at home too. So he's like protecting me. Okay. You know, and he's he's lets me come over whenever. And he's got older friends and they're in high school and 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 I'm like this kid that's just hanging out with him. Okay. And we weren't doing nothing bad. We were just like playing Halo and like freaking building with Legos. Like yeah. You know. No bad influence at all. Well, I'm over at Jacob's house one day, and once again, I was like 10. And um, I was—I remember being on his stairs, coming downstairs towards the front door, and I see this guy walk in. And this guy is like 6'5", 380 pounds. Uh, he's about 30 years old at the time. He's um, he's a Hispanic guy, and he's got like a—he's got like—he's like Hispanic and white, so he, he looks pretty white, but you can tell he's Hispanic. Right. And he's got, like, the big wire frame glasses, like the Jeffrey Dahmer, like, style glasses. Aviator type. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, his hair is slicked back, and, you know, he uh, just is, like, massive guy. Like I said, 6'5", 6'6", 380 pounds. Humongous. Yeah. Yeah. And, like, built. Like, he looks like he could throw a hard punch. Like, he's a big-ass dude. Uh, he didn't look, like, sloppy. You know, he's certainly obese, but he did not look, like, sloppy. And yeah. And, um very capable looking and so i like look at him and, and he's like hey hey he's like what's your name you know seth oh okay um do you like the buckeyes yeah do you like uh you like football yeah okay do you like playing video games yeah he's like oh man you should come up and hang out with us so jacob knows him jacob's been going to his house for a few years at this point jacob's known him for a while mm -hmm. and so i'm like okay well let me go home and ask my mom so i go home ask my mom my mom's like as long as you go jacob you're fine okay so I go to go, we go right up to his house and, you know, this was uh, really cool because in the car, you know, he, we go get some like chicken or something like that yeah. on the way. And then like, 
we're listening to like heavy metal, like Metallica, like freaking jamming out on freaking I seventy five driving to his house. <laughs> You know, this like I think this might be the first car I've ever been in that had AC, so it was like this like blast in AC, and it's you know it's just like man, it's like pretty cool, and we're we're going up there, and then like, you know, we get to his house, and and uh, when you walk in, um, it's got this like low ceiling. It's like it's like a nine foot ceiling, maybe eight foot ceiling, but there's acoustic acoustical ceiling tile, same thing you got in here. Yeah, and then it's it's got. The, the typical, like, two-by-four fluorescent lights throughout the whole thing. But yeah, it's yeah. a big open studio. Okay. Um, there's no rooms, okay? And so when I look to my right— It's like an office building, yeah. not a house. Well, it's, a, it's like a loft, like a studio loft. Okay. You know, that's like a, like college kids live in typically. Okay. And so I look to my right, and there's um there's two TVs and, like, two or three Xboxes. And in the, off to the back right corner, there's, like, a kitchen, like a little half wall and a bathroom back there. And then in the back right corner, there's uh, a couple desktop computers, okay? And then in the middle of the whole studio, there's, like, a big round table that has, like, all this Dungeons & Dragons stuff on there that we used to we used to play okay. the Dungeons & Dragons thing back in the day. And so the back left corner, like, when you first walk in the back left corner, is um, it's got these, like, black curtains that are hanging from the ceiling. And it kind of corners off that that part. And that's his bedroom. And so, um, I, first thing, you know, first impression, it's like messy, there's trash everywhere, but like, it didn't, I didn't give a shit. I was 10 mm-hmm. years old and like, right. we're going to play video games. Like, I yeah. don't, what do I care? Then I remember like going up there and this, the, you know, the refrigerator's full of like pop and, and we order pizza. So we got pop and pizza, coffee, energy drinks, like, and we got video games. Like, dude, mm-hmm. we're just going, I don't think I slept, you know, I yeah. would go up there on a Friday night. And I'd stay the night Friday night, Saturday night, and go home Sunday. And I don't, I, I don't think I ever slept when I was at his house because okay. it was just constant gaming and 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 eating. You know, it was awesome. Truthfully, it was awesome. He was an, he was a super fun guy to be around. And um, that's how this shit happens, right? Yep. So, um, obviously, you can tell the story's going. And so, um, after going up and hanging out with him for a couple months, he gets into the, to the. Uh, the, the grooming phase has already started un- unknowingly. Yep. And uh, I really didn't think anything of it. Like, I was, like, oblivious to this, all of this. And as a matter of fact, the first few times I went up there, I noticed that Jacob would sleep in his bed with him at night. And I never thought anything of it. I figured it was, like, if me and you were friends and we just slept in the same bed together. Like, sometimes right. you do that as— Yeah, you as, still had a level of innocence about it all. Yeah, yeah, somehow. And, um, and uh, you know, I I never picked up on anything weird— and one day, Jacob, we're at his house, and, and Jacob goes and goes get some tacos down the street. And uh, Jacob could drive at this point. And I'm sitting on the guy's lap. At, for some reason, at some point, it became normal for me to sit on the guy's lap. I mean, he was massive, and I was tiny. And I it just, I would sit on his lap, and like like a, like a, like you'd, like your son sits on your lap. It was just kind yeah. of how it was. And one day, I'll never forget the first time he touched me. His, his, he had these massive hands. I mean, like, dude's massive hands long nails and his knuckles were like uh really big and dry and like he would take his knuckles and like rub them together like this and you could hear it would sound like sandpaper mm. or he would do this and like that noise I'll never yeah. I'll never forget what that smell it sounds like you know um these like sensory details are really um for me they're not like traumatic but they are always in they're always a part like of me like seared in your mind yeah every time i smell old spice and it's, that's what he used. He used Old Spice everything. Oddly enough, I, I do too nowadays, but um, it's like, but that that's like one of those weird things. Like if I smell old, I know what Old Spice smells like uh, because of because of that yeah. guy. And so uh, the knuckles thing, he had these long nails. I mean, his, and his knuckles were rough. Like they would, like they would, he, you could cut you with his knuckles. Like they were, mm. they were so dry. And, and so anyways, I say all that because um, I know what his hands feel like. And this is people who go through these kind of things. They know what that feels like for the rest of their lives. Yeah. You know, I'm serving like I, I tell people I'm serving a life sentence right now. Yeah. And um, that's just the nature of it. It'll, it'll never go away. I don't think. Um, and what I'm learning to do now is just to embrace it and say like, it's okay. You know. But his hand was on my left hip, and uh, his hand drops and brushes my butt, and he says, um, "I'm sorry." And I said, oh, it's not a big deal, whatever. And I'm thinking, like, if me and you bump in the hall. Right. You know, not, not a big deal. Yeah. 
And so he he puts his hand up on my butt and he he kind of grabs me and he says, "So this is okay." And right then and there, I was like, "Okay, here we go." I'm like, because mm. I was very situationally aware as a kid, being that I lived with my mom yeah. in that house, like I had to be aware of what was going on. And so I, I knew what was happening as soon as he did that. I was mm. just like, "Okay, I don't know what this is going to entail, but I know where this is going." And uh, I'm like, "Yeah, sure." And so he holds his hand on my butt. Jacob gets back. He obviously moves his hand out of the way. And then we get, um, or, you know, so, yeah. So so we go. I go home that weekend. Nothing else crazy happens that weekend. That was the first time he touched me. I'd known the guy for about three months probably at that point. Okay. Still 10 years old at this point. And um, my mom ends up getting connected with this guy at home who – was like a, a leader in his church, but he was addicted to crack and cocaine. He gets my mom addicted to crack and coke at 10 years old. And, uh, well, she, yeah, you, you I were, was 10. You were 10. Yeah. yeah. And so she's so she gets into hard drugs now at this point. Man. And we go into a, we move into a house. We move into this like um, duplex or double, whatever you want to call it. And the reason why I talk about this place is because my bedroom, I had a hardwood floor in my bedroom, and the floors were completely buckled all the way across, and it smelled like like piss and shit because the people that lived there before had, like, two or three dogs. They just locked in that room. And so I, I that was my bedroom. Oh. And yeah. and I would go in there, and the ceiling had a, um, a hole in the ceiling that was about two feet wide, about four feet deep. Like, literally, I could look up, and I could see the attic structure, like, above. I could see the, the roof decking above in the attic. Yeah. No protection from the elements. And so there was a leak as well. Like it would rain and come straight into my room or snow and it would come straight into my room. And um, that's why the hardwoods were buckled. They'll, they'll do that when they're damaged, when they're yeah. subject to weather. And my mom had like no, this is where like I really lose a lot of respect for the decisions that she was making because she had no, no, um, objection to putting me in that room. That was like Seth's room. It was a small room. That's Seth's room. And it was never like a thing of like sleep in your sister's room where it's warm. Or yeah, there was no like motherly concern. Yeah, yeah man. Yeah. It, which And I slept on this like four-inch mattress on the floor. Like a giant pillow, basically. Yeah, basically. Yeah. And I had a thin little blanket. And I remember sleeping. And I was freezing cold every single night. And I'd piss the bed every night. Every single night. And so every morning I'd wake up freezing in my own urine um, get ready for school. I'm going to school. I'm being bullied because I, I have poor ratty clothes. Yeah. I have holes in my shoes. Uh, I don't know if I smell like pee or not going to school. I probably do. Um, you know, I just, I was in a bad place at, at 10, uh, um, 11 years old uh, over the course of like living in this house. I think we lived there for about a year or so. And, um, so the, the part that I really try to stress what's so crazy about this whole thing about my story is that all of this was happening at the same time. It wasn't like a, like this happened for a couple of years and then this happened after that. They were just all layered. Yeah. So like Monday through Friday, I was dealing with like my mom, abuse, drugs, violence. Jeez, man. And then Friday night, Saturday night, I was going to this guy's house being molested. Right. And so by the, when I was 12 years old, um, at this point, by the time I was 12, I had seen many, many people coming in and out of my house completely high out of their minds. I would see people – I actually had a family member who was pregnant at the time who was so high, like off of crack or coke, I don't know which one. She was like shaking in this chair in my living room like like a zombie. Like she was like – I remember looking at her and, and, and her husband and they're like – they're like sitting on this love seat that we had and, and their, their hands are like on the arms almost like they're on like a roller coaster and like they're just sitting there – like lean back, blankly staring, and I don't know, and then they're, they're they're just like just shaking, and I'm just like, what the fuck, you know? I'm like, yeah. dude, oh my god. And you're 12. Yeah, I I, I don't even know if I was 12 at that point. So, Man. but and that wasn't the first time I'd seen that. You know, yeah. I'd seen this many many times. But these people would come in my house and go right to the bathroom, and they they would sit there and smoke crack and coke for hours, like hours. And Man. what's uh, what's really crazy too is at 12 years old. You know, a lot of people have trouble addressing their boss nowadays, right? Hey, uh, I got to get off work early on Friday. Like, that's like a hard conversation to have nowadays, yeah. right? That's a that's a tough conversation because you don't know what your boss is going to say. Mm -hmm. Well, at 12 years old, I sat down with my mom and my sisters and I said, Mom, 
I know you're using drugs. I just want to know what's going on. Mm. You know, I just like, hey, I just, I just want you to tell me what's going on. And she denied everything, basically. Told me, you know, shut up. I don't do any drugs. You mind your own business. This, this and that. And she was selling our, our food stamps for drugs, <sighs> where we were eating, like, egg noodles and, like, butter, water for, like, freaking food. Um, yeah, man, it was, it was really bad. And, uh, so, so when I was, when I was 12, we were actually at my neighbor's house. This is very coincidental. We're at my neighbor's house and we're watching the show Intervention. That was back, out back <laughs> yeah, in the day. I know what you're talking about. Yeah. And like so like A&E or TLC or something yep. like that. Yeah. And every, every, at the end of every episode, they would show their line, their email and phone number saying, yeah. if you know somebody. So we're like looking at each other, we're like, we know somebody. Yeah. And so we kind of were like formulating this plan and we go to walk outside and no shit, there's a fire in my front yard. And my younger sister comes back in. She's hysterical. She's screaming, crying. And we're like, what the hell's going on? So we go out there. We see the fire. Next thing I see is like my mom's boyfriend comes out. He's got some blood on the front of his shirt. He's in like a wife beater. And um, then my mom comes out and she's like storming all over the place. She's yelling, screaming, throwing shit. And I'm just, I fall apart because I'm like, okay, this is not good. Yeah. And, um, I remember like a police car shows up out of nowhere and she's in the back of the cop car. Like, I don't remember how all this happened, but she's in the back of this police car and I'm sitting there looking at my mom in the back of this car and I can, it's almost like, um, like, um, I can see it happening. Like there's a camera hovering above me. Mm. Uh, and yeah. I know. Like you, you are watching the it out of from body above. experience. Yeah. Yep. Like you, you dissociated from how intense it was basically. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I remember, but you remember it. Oh yeah. That way from above looking down, basically. I can just see, I can see it now. I can see it happening. Like, I, but I don't see it from my eyes. I can see it from like a third party looking yeah. at it, looking at the situation. Like you're watching a movie almost. Yeah, exactly. And I remember, like, um, my mom was in the back of the car, and she's looking at me through this glass, and I don't know what's going to happen, but I know she's being taken from me, and um, she tells me she loves me, and she's like, I'll get you back, and all these things, um, and I'm just terrified because I don't have anybody. I don't know where my dad's at. Yeah, I don't have, like anybody to help me. I don't, I don't know what to do. And so the cop like takes her away and I don't even remember like anybody sorting anything out, like any, any like law enforcement, like stepping in. Like with you kids. I don't remember any of that. I mean, that may have happened, but I remember going back into the house and like I, we had like a bunch of family there all of a sudden, like cousins and and aunts and uncles and stuff. And, you know, um, I think my sisters went one way and I went another. So at 12 years old, my mom was gone out of the picture. My sisters went somewhere. I went another. I ended up going to my – after about a month or so, I ended up at my dad's house, and then I got into a bunch of trouble out there. So I lived with my dad for, like, maybe a couple of weeks, and mm-hmm. I got in a bunch of trouble at that school, and I was about to go to juvie. And so I went back to my hometown, and, and basically when that happened, for about four or five months, I bounced around to several different houses, living with, like, random mm-hmm. people, going to different schools – I switched schools like four times in like three months, three or four months. And um, I'm doing like it's all on my own. Like I'm like calling these schools and telling them like, hey, I've got to transfer now. And I've got to find a place to live. I had I lived with my some family, my cousins, and their, their parents told me we're having another baby and we can't afford you. Like you need to find somewhere to go. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, well, here we go. So I grabbed my box of clothes and, and kept it moving, you know. Um it is look looking back on it, it's truly a miracle. I did not end up in a bad place. I don't I don't understand it now. Like I don't there was like maybe I don't I, I don't ever want to attribute anything to luck, but there might be some damn luck somewhere in my story. Mm-hmm. Um but I was bouncing around to a bunch of different places and then I was living with this this one family and uh my mom called me one day and she says, you know, uh she's like I'm going to come back and get you. And I tell her, no, I don't want to live with you over the phone, which was really hard. That was like Mm -hmm. a really, really profound moment in my life again, because I could have just said, okay, and gone back and lived with my mom, Mm -hmm. you know, and I I decided not to. 
And I hadn't seen her in like four months, like four or five months. I don't know how long it had been at this point, but I, I this was like a random phone call one day, yeah. you know, which is crazy to think about. Like I said, because I'm bouncing around at 12 years old, like right. living with random people. And, I, and I, I never had a concern of like where my mom was at. I was just kind of like, I'm just getting by right now. You're just in survival mode. Yeah. Yeah. And, 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 uh, so that family that I was with, they offered to adopt me. I said, yes, uh, because they have no relation or connection to me. Um, they knew that wasn't going to happen probably. And so they, somehow my grandparents got contacted my grandparents came and picked me up. I show up at my grandparents' house and my sisters are, my sisters are there. Okay. And so my sisters, um, they end up going back and live with my mom for some reason. They're just like indoctrinated into that life. And yeah. when I moved in with my grandparents, I, I was like, okay, finally, I'm like, I'm done. Like I'm out of it. I'm done. Like I, I was saved finally. Right. And so my grandma asked to adopt me. I say, yes, my sisters go back and live with my mom. I'm with my grandparents alone, single child now. And I'm just like over the moon, happy. Mm. Um, and then, you know, Mondo, this guy's name is Mondo, my my uh, abuser, uh, calls, and, you know, we're still hanging out. And so I got to tell my grandparents, hey, well, Grandma, I want to go and hang out with my friend Mondo. Well, who's Mondo? Well, he's this guy. Well, how old is he? 34. No, we're not doing that. Yeah. And so I'm like, oh, no, he's not like that. Like, I'm defending him, you know. And so he he comes and meets my grandparents, and he convinces my grandparents that he's a good guy. And that's what they do. Uh, and he was he was a part of my family from that point, you know. I was a part of his. He was a part of mine. I would go I'd go to his Christmases, his Thanksgivings, his, like, whatever holidays. And imagine, like, I don't know if you got a brother, but imagine if you had a brother and he shows up to your your Christmas party with a with a 12-year-old kid that looks like a little girl because yeah. he's got long hair. And it's like, and he's never had a girlfriend. Like, he's never had, like, a, mm. you know, nothing. Like, he just shows up with this kid all the time. It's kind of weird, and nobody ever said anything. And so this guy had like three, four sisters, his mom, and I would always like I knew I knew them all. They all knew me, mm. you know. And, and and he was molesting me from the time. At, so at this point, I was thirteen when I moved with my grandparents. Um, and by the time I was thirteen, he had been molesting me for uh, almost three years at this point, and 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 like every single weekend, like there's fifty two weekends in a year. I was probably at his house at least 45 of those 52 Friday night, Saturday night. And then after, after about six months, it was pretty much a constant like sexual drive from him. Almost like, um, the way I kind of try to explain it is like, if you're dating a girl after three months, you know, maybe you're kind of like, like, Hey, we've been dating for three months. Or maybe after six months, you're like, Hey, we've been dating for six months. Can we at least something? You know, um, or even after you get married, it's like, okay, we've been together for a year now. Like, can we do something, please? Mm -hmm. Like, there's like a, there's like an innate drive. And so that's kind of how it felt after six months. It was just like, as soon as I got up there, it was like this, like pressure in the room. It's like, if I know somebody was over here staring yeah. at me, I can just feel yeah. it. I'm just, I, all I want to do is play video games, man. Like I just come up here to play video games and eat pizza. Like, mm -hmm. I don't want to do all this extra shit. And, um, no, it was there though. And so by the time I was 13, um, we can elaborate on this if you want, but I'll, I'll put it like this one. By the time I hit 13 years of age, I had experienced every sexual encounter, engagement act, whatever you want to call it, everything by the time I was 13 years old with this man, like multiple times. Mm. Um, you know, so my mom was taken away. My my innocence, my dignity, like pride, anything I had regarding manhood was taken away from yeah. me by this man. He would make comments to me as I was going through puberty um, about growing and hair and things like this. Um, you know, it, you know, he would touch me, and then he would force me to touch him. Same thing with like oral sex, the reciprocation of that, um, and then you know, he eventually leads up to him yeah. raping me. And uh, I remember being 13 years old and I was sitting on his toilet. Like after he was done, he like cleans me up with a towel. I'm sitting on his toilet, like getting everything else out of my body. And at that point, that's definitely one of the lowest moments of my life where I'm just like, I, I have no value in this world anymore mm -hmm. at 13 years old, man. And um, I was scared I had HIV. I was scared I had AIDS. I was scared like something. I was scared like, I, well, I know I'm not gay, 
So if I say anything, everybody's going to think I'm gay. Yeah. Everybody's going to make fun of me. Everybody's going to attack me because kids are brutal. And I, my life is over. My life was over at 13 years old. Um, uh, you know, I remember he had like a drawer of Vaseline next to his bed. And I would always look at it like I was like terrified of that thing because I knew one day like it's going to happen to me. And like I could see the scoops of like from his fingers when he would use his fingers on me. Like I could see the scoops of his fingers like in the Vaseline jar um, yeah, so that's like really disturbing to think about, but all these things had happened to me like multiple times and, um, and, you know, so despite leaving my mom's house, I was still at my, my I was with my grandparents, but this was still happening and it went on for uh, a couple more years. I was f- almost 16 years old. I was about a month away from being 16 and I was at his house and my, f- my friend who was a couple years younger than me was there, this different kid. And this is the first time I remember seeing him go back to that guy's bed with him. And um, I'm thinking to myself, like, we're not going to let this happen. Mm. And so it's kind of a long story, but I'll I'll sum it up. Um, I had reached out to Jacob that night, and I said, hey, I need you to come to my house tomorrow. I need to talk to you. So um, that night, some things kind of happened. I was I was molested that, night, that weekend as well. Uh, actually, I think he raped me that weekend as well. Um, And, uh, Jacob comes to my house the next day and we're kind of walking around the house laughing and joking, whatever. Mm -hmm. And we go back to my bedroom and I tell Jacob, you know, Hey man, like there's something I got to tell you and I don't know how to tell you and I'm scared and I've been wanting to say this for a really long time and I just like, don't know what to say. Don't know how to say it. And... I'm like pacing back and forth in my room and the same feelings I had when my mom was taken away from me or the same feelings I was having at this moment. And it's like this like cold, but hot, like sweating profusely. Um, you're just weak. You feel like your stomach is empty. Um, it feels like if you like, I had no strength in my body. Like I couldn't even squeeze something. I couldn't, you know, you're there was like a panic attack. Yeah. Right? And this is what I imagine like death would feel like. Like I, I felt like my body was leaving me. Like I felt like I was, I was dying. Like mm. it literally like felt like my blood was just leaving my body and going into the ground. And, and this was it for me. And, um, I'm panicking so bad because the, the fear of rejection and denial, cause this guy's a part of our family. He's a yeah. part of our system. And, um, Jacob looks at me. I couldn't say it. Jacob looks at me and says, he touched you, didn't he? And I fall apart. Fall to the ground. I had hardwood floors in my bedroom, and I'm, I'm like grabbing the floor, and I'm like just like punching the floor, and I'm just like crying and sweating, and just so much emotions coming out of my body. And the next thing he says is, uh, "He did it to me too." And I turn up and I look at him, and I'm just like, "What the hell, dude?" I'm like, you know, because Jacob, like I told you, is uh, he's like my hero, man. Mm-hmm. Like he's like my father. Like if I if I had a you know my big brother or like yeah. he's, he's like that that solid person in my life that that person that I want to be yeah and um and I couldn't believe it man so he the next thing he says is like what do you want to do what do you want to do about it do you want to um do you want to report him or do you want to keep it a secret and I was like nope fuck this guy we got to report him like I'm not gonna let this guy do it to anybody else yeah and so we go out we tell my grandparents my grandma's destroyed she's torn apart she's like crying and like my baby my baby she's holding me um and i feel really bad about that because uh, i defended the guy for so long yeah and uh you know unfortunately my grandma's not here anymore she she died in a couple years ago but i that's if there's one thing i wish is that she i wish she was here kind of see the things that i'm um the things i'm doing now because you know, uh, I know she was torn apart and she got to see my daughter a couple times, but, and, and, you know, she, she got to see me join the army and, and go to Afghanistan and be married. And, 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 you know, I remember the first time telling her, like, I think I met the one mm-hmm. when I, when I met my wife and I just like these like feelings of like love, like that you should have from a parent. And my grandma gave that to me, and and unfortunately she's not here to kind of see where it's all going, mm. uh, which really sucks because you know that that day 
that I reported. I know she was just destroyed. And so, uh, I'm sorry, go, man. Yeah. Yeah. It's okay. Yeah. We, we go to the hospital and, uh, um, yeah, we go to the hospital and they take me up there. And I remember this really, really profound is like, this whole day would take me probably an hour or two to explain in its own. There's so much to this day. Yeah. It's just so crazy. It was such an incredible day. So many, so many crazy things happened on this day. But the one thing I'll say here is that I remember getting up there and the nurses were like, well, and because the cop shows up and we're kind of thinking to ourselves, like, how are we going to get this guy today? Like, we have to have something concrete to get him today. Right. Um, Because as of right now, it's like hearsay, basically, or whatever. I don't know. He said, she said, maybe. I don't know. So I'm sitting here, and I'm like, well, no. Like, he he raped me this weekend, and I have, like, you can test me right now. Um, Because he had done something to me Saturday night, and I had his DNA on my body, and I knew I did. And so what's crazy is, like, at 15 years old, as I knew that I had to keep my clothes on, and I knew I couldn't take a shower, I knew, like, I had to, like, keep his DNA on me. And so while I was in the hospital, I'm like, I'm like, his DNA is on me right now. I'm telling you. And so like, okay. And the nurses were so proud of me because they're like, holy shit. Yeah. Like, take your clothes off. Well, it's definitely not the norm. Right. Right. Typically, it's like you're like a week or two late. You know, it's like we don't have anything. So I take my clothes off. They swab me. I think they found DNA in all three places, like my between my butt, my my penis, and my mouth. I think they find DNA in all three places. Um, but they, I know they found it in my underwear, um, like his hair or traces or whatever. And so, um, and I tell him too, I tell him, I'm like, there's a towel next to his bed. I'm telling you right now, there's a towel next to his bed and it's got Vaseline mm-hmm. on it and it's got his DNA and mine on there. I guarantee it. Cause that's what he used to clean me up when he was done. And, uh, I, they're obviously like, like Jesus, you know, like, yeah. holy shit. And, yeah. and, and I, once again, I mean, 15, I'm like telling this cop, like some really twisted, nasty stories um, that you have to do. And I knew that I had to tell him like the, the nastiest things that had happened to me to get them to act. Yeah. Well, yeah. And, and not necessarily to get them to act, but to, um, unfortunately when this happens to a child or to anybody, the, the worst, the, the worse it is, the better it is to punish that person. Right. So if, if, if you right, get the more egregious, yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Okay. Yep. So they have more to go on. Yeah. If he would have just fondled me and that's all I said, then this guy may have gotten one yeah. thing, right? But I'm like, no, like, look, I laid out. And I'm like, this is what happened to me. And I still wasn't able to tell him everything. I, um, I held back a little bit, but I did tell him some pretty... Were you... Was it fear? Was it shame? What? Why, why did... Man, that's shame. Shame. There were some things that actually I said that day that I did not remember saying. And I just, I got to go back and interview this cop. Um, yeah, I saw that recently. Yeah, yeah, so I went and I found him after 13 years, and I went and interviewed him about his day and, like, what his day looked like. Mm-hmm. That, that interview alone is just, like, mind-blowing. But, like, 10 minutes into the interview, he brings up this story that I told him that I forgot that I told him. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, I almost stopped the interview because I was embarrassed. Like, I was like, okay, we're not going to do this. And I almost, like, killed it right there because I couldn't believe that that happened to me, and I I forgot about it. And, you know, and I was just like, oh, my God. And uh, you can't tell in the interview or nothing like that. I'm, I'm pretty good at maintaining my composure despite a little bit of tears in my eyes. Um, so, like, uh, but, yeah, there were some, like, twisted things that happened to me. And, um, you know, I don't tell those stories for shock factor or anything like that. Yeah. But I tell them so that people understand what's happening to our children. Yeah. And, and it's happening right now. It's happening tonight. It's going to happen tomorrow night. It's happening to one in three girls and one in four boys. Um, so, so anyways, yeah, we, we do all that, and, and, and the, I tell them all the details, and they go and arrest them that night. Um, kind of to wrap all that up, the guy, like a month or two later, um, uh, pleads guilty. He gets 10 years in jail or prison. Um, that was in 2011. So he would be free today. Uh, to go and do whatever the hell he wants to do. Um, fortunately enough, he died in 2019 in prison. Uh, he he requested parole. He was denied. And like a month or two later, he died. And so I got the phone call when I was in Afghanistan. They're like, hey, just so you know, 
uh, this guy died. And I said, okay, cool. Like, whatever. Is there, um, is there a sense of peace about that for you? Like, that you won't ever have to cross paths with him? I, I, like freedom or there something? There probably is. Um, I don't, I don't feel that. But what I'll tell you is that if he, if he was out right now, there would probably be a sense of insecurity or, or to tell your story or something. Well, or? just maybe, but also, um, just fear. Cause I can find you on Facebook, right? Yeah. I, I know where I can find out where you live. I could, if I spend enough time doing it, I'll find where you are. Yeah. You know? Um, so like there's those fears. Um, and I don't have those cause he's not here and I never had those cause he was in prison, but had he gotten out, I think I would have maybe, I don't know. So I can't, I don't, but I don't feel relieved. And even, even after I reported him, I was like, okay, well, now I don't have any plans this weekend. Like, I'm like, what mm-hmm. am I going to do this weekend? That was the extent of it, of the traumatic effect that it had on me uh, initially. Um, looking back on it, I know I acted very poorly in, in certain places in my life, especially with girls. I was very, like, sexually motivated. Um, I was very driven in that in that way. Um, and then also, um, yeah, just just... I just did not have a good head on my shoulders. But, yeah, but I mean, how could how yeah. could you? Um, yeah. Can we? I don't want to cut you short. Yeah. On what you were explaining, but can you dive into because regardless of this, what type of trauma we experience, typically what happens is we get stuck at the emotional age we were mm-hmm. when that happens, mm-hmm. right? What have you done? How have you been able to unpack this over time and heal from it in a way that's... I think a lot of people hear your story, right, and they go, well, you know, he's just got to ignore that that ever happened and try and, you know, like, so what do you do, right? It's such a traumatic, evil thing that happened to you, right? Like, just on a soul level, it's Mm -hmm. it, it just, like, hits you, you know? What has Seth done to like work through that without going crazy? Yeah, uh, I did go crazy for a long time. Fortunately, I never tapped into like drugs or any alcohol or anything like that. But I, um, I really just started my healing journey maybe uh, within the last two years, within the last okay. year. So, were you? Do you think you were repressing everything up to that point, or like, and like, I guess. I'm just kind of reflecting back on my own experience, mm-hmm. which is drastically different than yours, but mm-hmm. it, it's kind of like hidden, right? Mm-hmm. It wasn't like this big overt thing, right? And I was completely oblivious to all the things I was carrying until yeah. like yeah. I had this like real big moment, like, holy cow. So like, what did that look like for you? Yeah. So, so a couple things happened. Uh, a couple of key moments when I, right before my daughter was born, this is like very cliche, but I read uh, Extreme Ownership. Okay. That book freaking blew my mind. Like, I was like, when I read Extreme Ownership, I realized that I had been, like, just this ego-driven person that, and and, and I I wanted to prove myself to everybody because of what had happened to me. Like, yeah. I'm, I just, and you, you don't realize You wanted it. to be untouchable, right? Yeah. You weren't going to let anyone in type of thing. Yeah, and, and, and so when I read Extreme Ownership, like, I, I changed who I was. And I was a soldier at the time. I was in the 82nd. My daughter was about to be born. And I, so I knew I was like, I gotta, I gotta fix something. I have this like victim mentality. Yeah. And so I just started owning everything and I'm like, you know what? I'm just going to fix all my shit. Mm. And I became a better leader for sure. I mean, I, I was never a great leader. Um, I cared deeply. I just did not know how to get these guys to, I just, I love them so much, but I was the bulldog, mm. like typical mm. bulldog, okay. 11 Bravo, like chewing guys up. Um, and I just, I didn't have that natural leader ability. So I had to, I had to jack guys up to get them to, to, Mm. you know, um, but I loved all the guys that I served, but, but anyways, with that reading extreme ownership really shifted my mindset on, on being a man, basically. Like I read that book and I was like, okay, I don't, I don't have a father in my life. I don't have this father figure or nothing like that, but this is what I can do to, to be a better man. That was a big impact. Um, you know, so I read that, went to Afghanistan, came back, when I got when I was getting out of the army, I was I was very deep, deeply suicidal, like just really ready to kill myself. I mean, I battled suicide um, on a daily occurrence for fifteen years, probably. Wow. 
um, like literally every single day. It's it's like as simple as you writing your name on a piece of paper. Uh, it's like it's like yeah, I could just kill myself. Like I can, yeah, I'll just drive out here. I'll just maybe drive into a car. You know, I'll just drive into traffic or a tree. I remember going down Chicken Road at Fort Bragg like every morning, wanting to drive into a tree because I was just ready to go. Um, because so, of everything you'd been through. Yeah, yeah, and 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 the army brings out a lot of that stress, and then. You know, I was getting out of the army, which is stressful. And then oh, yeah. you're you're getting out. I had two kids. I had to take care of them. And and um so a lot of those emotions all piled up. And and so to your when I say uh even when I reported this guy, and like that was like the end of my terrible childhood, um, nothing affected me then. But when I was like getting out of the army, like so there's something that happened. And then the reason why I say this is because when something happens to you, you may not feel the effects of it right now, but if you don't take care of it, it's festering inside of you. Yeah. It is just a giant. It, yep. It's just a shadow that is growing and growing and growing, and all it's waiting for is for you to have one weak moment, and then boom, it's going to come in mm-hmm. and tear your freaking life apart. So if you don't address that giant, the giant is going to kill you. It's going to kill your family. It's going to kill your children. It's going to. It's just that giant is going to take over your life, yeah. and it's going to drag you down. And, and, you know, when I was getting out of the army, that's what was happening. Like I had some like triggering kind of moments and it just, it tore me apart. And like, I was done. Like I couldn't, I couldn't move. Mm-hmm. I couldn't focus. Um, very, very close to like pulling the trigger. And, um, you know, I had t- two kids, you know, my son was a newborn. I remember looking at my son, like, and you have bad thoughts. You have bad thoughts, man. Like I, I've looked at my own kids and had bad thoughts of mm-hmm. like, doing things and and because you're you're just in a bad place yeah. and you just don't want to be alive and it's like i and the the bad thing too is like my my wife her family's well off and so i know i can kill myself today and they're fine you know so like you start to have yeah. those those bad things where it's like they they actually don't even need me mm. um so if i just die i don't have to deal with this and they don't have to deal with me yeah. and they can go and live you know my wife can go live with her parents and they'll be fine you know, so that's like another, it's like was, a way out. That's what you were telling yourself. Yeah. And, my, you know, so um, the way I've kind of gotten out of that is in, in the last, like, year or so, I knew I wanted to write a book, so I started writing my, my book, and then I started hearing other people's stories, and when I hear somebody else's story, I will hear that we have, like, similar um, views on life yeah. and trauma, right? Right. So... If anybody goes through life and they have any kind of trauma, traumatic experience, doesn't matter what it is, yep. um, they may go down their bad route of like drugs or or whatever. So it doesn't matter if they're a combat veteran, um, you know, they got blown up or they got divorced or childhood abuse or drugs. All of these traumatic things that can happen in your life, um, they're all different. But at the end, we all have the same like path of healing, mm-hmm. and that and on that same path, it, like. There's loneliness, there's depression, anxiety, there's all these bad things yeah. that trauma brings, and it's it's all the same feelings. It doesn't matter which, what we've been through that's different. We could be completely different lifestyles, but on that path of healing, it's all the same. Yeah. And so that's what I've realized in the last, like, year. And I've as I've listened to more and more stories, I'm like, holy shit, like, these guys have never been molested. They've never been abused. Yeah. But they have the same feelings that I do about life. And mm-hmm. so, okay, well, now if I tell my story— um, somebody else will heal from this because they will know that they're not alone. And, yes. and, I, and I'm not a typical victim. Like I don't, I don't look like the typical victim. You yeah. know, I'm a, I'm a bigger guy. I'm a freaking. I try to be an athlete. I do jujitsu. I run ultra marathons. I was a, a combat veteran. Like when, when you put all those things on a resume. Yeah. People don't think victim. Y- yeah. yeah. Right. And so they don't think like this yeah. guy, anything ever happened to this guy. And so when I go and speak to a crowd or I go and speak on a podcast or I go and, uh, tell my story to anybody, they're just like, holy shit. Yeah. And, and they just can't believe it, you know? And I tell my story so that people can gain perspective because I think perspective, mm-hmm. you get perspective two ways. That's either experience or storytelling. So yeah. you either tell stories or listen to stories. And when you gain perspective, um, it helps you utilize gratitude in your daily life, right? Definitely. The experience part of perspective is you can either go out and get that experience by joining the army or, or going on a missionary or reading books. Like experience can be developed so many ways. But when you ex- when you experience things, whether it's reading or physically or whatever, you're getting perspective. You're understanding different points of view. You're mm-hmm. understanding different ways of life. 
So there's your like two ways of gaining perspective, right? And your experience, you can either go seek it or you can be born into it like I was. Yeah. Fortunately enough, I made it out. So I have a unique perspective on life where I've seen like the worst shit that you can see. Um, but I've also seen some of the most beautiful things you can see. I, I, I do very well for myself now. I have won national construction awards. I have been on top of the Eiffel Tower. I've been I've seen the world and from views that not very many people get to see. So with me, I have a unique perspective on life. I yeah. know what it has to offer despite what it can do mm. to you as well. So with perspective, you gain some gratitude. You I can I can express gratitude daily. I can be so happy for myself, my children. Yeah. I'm happy that I wake up and see my children every day. I'm happy to be who I am, to be strong, capable, and, and, and all these things. And and with perspective and gratitude, I use those two tools to be stronger every single day, mentally, physically, emotionally, just a resilient body. Yeah. But you need those two things. Like, and that's what I'm trying. That's the reason why I tell my story. So somebody can be like, okay, if this guy who's just an average guy can do it, I can do it too. He's yeah. no different than I am. Right. And so a couple of points I want to make on this. Uh, first, I got to quote Dave Hurt. Um, he he told this to me because I made a comment about like downplaying my own experience. Yeah. And he, he interrupted me and was like, no, 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 no. Yeah, maybe my life was, quote, harder, right? But my hard and your hard what happened to you was the hardest thing you went through at, the, at your life. So if you're listening to this right now and you're hearing Seth's story and you're like, oh my gosh, this is so far beyond anything I've been through. Like, I'm just a wuss. Well, no, that's not true. You just, your your hardest thing you've had is just different, right? And so it's had the same impact on you potentially because, it, it, you know, it's a scale and, and it's, it's, a, it's the perspective thing. So, um, Maybe if you're hearing this, you go, wow, that's insane. That's like so brutal. I don't know if I could have gone through that or whatever. That's that's a false narrative you're telling yourself. So take that perspective, listen to Seth's story, and then go like, okay, these are the ways he got through it. I can use the same tools and and also be grateful that my experience wasn't that bad, right? So don't, don't lie to yourself, one. Um, 100% agree with you about perspective and gratitude. Like those two things... When you practice, it's a practice, it's a daily discipline to, to choose to express gratitude. And you're not the first person I've talked to who's, you know, had that type of abuse. And every single one of them who's shared their story with me says that they practice gratitude. They're, they're grateful for the things that happened as painful as it was because of the perspective they have today and because of the way they get to help others heal today. So Mm -hmm. that is something everyone needs to embrace is that gratitude, um, and then I had a question around at what point in your marriage or dating or whatever did like you tell your wife all of this? Because I can only imagine that that was, well, one, you already alluded to it, right? Y- your views on sex and love and all that was probably massively distorted. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm, su- I'm sure there was some dysfunction in terms of your yep. relationship. And then, you know, how did you kind of have your uh, transparent conversation about that with her and how has that been? Because it, it, essentially it's hers now too, in a way. Right. Yeah. Uh, so first off, I got to give her a lot of credit because she, for, she dated an army guy, which is bad enough. <laughs> and you know, you deal with all the bullshit. That my comes. wife, my wife jokes specifically that she told herself she would never marry a man in uniform. Yeah. yeah. We've been married 10 years now. So exactly. Yeah. There you go. So yeah, got her. Uh, <laughs> So yeah, so my my wife, I met her when she was in college, and okay. we, um, you know, I was like the typical army guy, like I was like got my dog tags and my uniform, like <laughs> this is all I need, yeah, you know, get the haircut, yeah. And so we, so we, so we, uh, we started dating, and um, yeah, this, you know, the sex and everything like that was, was my whole sexual experience was like very distorted. Like you said, mm-hmm. uh, I was very sexually motivated. Yeah. Um, and I told her pretty quick, but what's crazy about my wife is <laughs> we, I, like I said, I think I knew she was the one and I don't know why, but we got married, uh, within six months of dating. Um, 
And then we actually didn't tell anybody for seven months. So we were together for 13 months. We were married for seven of those. We didn't tell a soul that we got married because I was going to brag. And so I needed to bring her with me and like, yeah, all that, yeah, you know, yeah, whatever. Yeah. The typical did, army. Did the courthouse thing. Yeah. You know. We did the same thing. <laughs> yeah. So like, it's like a very typical army. Yeah. It's like the thing you tell your privates like not to yeah, do. Yeah. We did it. Yep. And we made it work yeah. somehow. Uh, we've been, we just had our anniversary or seven year anniversary. We've been together for seven and a half years. So. Um, yeah, but w- w- to answer your question, I'm pretty sure I told her like pretty quick. Like okay. I, I kind of, I told her I was like molested, like, you know, at a, at a young age and, and, and quickly, I, that was quick. Now I did not know this. So I just started talking about my sexual abuse stuff about eight weeks ago. Um, so it's all really recent. Um, she listened to like one of my heavier interviews mm. and, uh, she read my book as well, like the preliminary yeah. copy. And, um, she basically was like, I don't know how you survive because I would like, she had no idea that yeah. the extent of it, which I thought I had disclosed more of that to her, but apparently not. Apparently, I was very brief about the, about it all. Mm. Um, I, I did not think I was, but uh, yeah. So I, I do remember telling her quickly though, and I just felt comfortable telling her. Mm. And I was just like, like, what are you gonna do? You gonna leave me? Like, whatever. <laughs> like I was, you know. So that's why I say I give her a lot of credit because, like I said, marrying somebody in the army is tough enough, and then when you deal with somebody like me who Mm -hmm. I have emotional, I'm an emotional person. I have emotional damage. I, you know, you talk about like the sex things, for example, um, one of them that gets to me a lot is like, uh, if, if, if she is feeling affectionate, even in public, like public display of affection, Mm -hmm. it just bothers me. Uh, I don't like to hug and kiss and hold hands in in public because I feel like I'm being watched. Like, I feel like somebody's like watching me like, Oh, You know, they're right, you know, it's just like this like sickening feeling. Mm. And that's really hard because, you know, women, they want to be loved and held and and, and things like that. For me, it just like it makes my skin crawl. Mm. Like it's like disturbing on another level. Like if I'm like being touched or like touched in public or like she wants to hold my hand or something, I'm just like, like it just I don't know why it just like bothers me Mm. to my core. And it's just like so. So that. That's why I tell my story too, is because I want people to realize like the punishment, like this guy got 10 years in prison. Yeah. I'm serving a life sentence. I don't know about yeah. him. I mean, he's dead, but some of these people, they survive, they live, they move on with their lives and they're, right. they're enjoying the last bit of their life. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and, and he got a free healthcare plan yeah. for 10 years. And, and you're free- having to, un- you're having to and what un- am I doing? untangle this giant yeah. ball. Yeah. Like- and he got, he got 10 years in prison. So he got a, he got three hot meals and a cot and, and cable. And a, a rec room, probably, you know. Yeah. And now there's so many freaking pedophiles that they get their own place in prison, so they're not treated any different. And what do I got? I got this life sentence, you know. Mm-hmm. I got to explain my emotions to my wife a lot. Yeah. Uh, I have to raise two kids, you know, and make sure nothing happens to them. To that point. Do you think it was just just a lack of awareness? Like like parents just didn't think this stuff used to happen or like you know because it's it seems like your grandparents were relatively involved in your life. Yeah. Not I, I don't know. Um I guess what are the words of caution you have to all the parents out there cuz like if your kids are hanging out with adults, they got to stop. Your kids need to hang out with people their own age. That's period. Mm-hmm. Like, not a friend that's five years older. Well, and act to that point, too, sorry. Yeah. You, before we started, you were talking about this aunt and uncle you had that yeah. were. Can, can you go into that if you're willing? Because I think a lot of people think, oh, well, yeah. family members are safe, too. And it's like, not always. So 34% of the time, it's a family member. So 34% of the time, a child is molested, it's by a family member. Um, 95% of the time, it's by somebody they know just personally. Yeah. You know, so 34% of that is, is a family member. Um, obviously then you have close friends and things like that. So yeah, there's a lot to unpack there. Um, I'll go into a little bit of that. Um, I don't want to tell too much of that, but yeah. yes, I, I lived with an aunt and uncle at a, at a, at a brief moment in time, um, a couple times. And like, yeah, that they were very like sexually like proud of like what they did with their sex life. And they would talk about it openly and, to to kids to you kids around us like yeah. maybe not to us but like in in our presence which is just yeah and like I remember seeing my aunt naked multiple times like almost 
like like she was intentionally exposing herself to me, you mm-hmm. know, and and people are disgusting and twisted. So if you yeah. didn't, you know, if, if the people did not already know that, it is true. They do some weird things to kids, you know. There's um even as young as, you know, 12 months old, you know, 15 <sighs> months old. Like imagine I, well, don't imagine, but just people do that to a tiny little body, you know, that that is completely defenseless. Yeah. And and they'll do that, you know. And so yet to your point, don't trust anybody. You you don't and it's not like a um you have to be on edge, but you just have to be aware, you know. Yeah. And if you're like I said, if your kids are hanging out with other people that are older, they got to stop. If it's they're hanging out with older kids, one day that kid's going to be 16 and that kid's going to be driving them around. One day that kid's going to be 18 and that kid's going to be buying them cigarettes or mm-hmm. drugs or whatever. Yeah. Like just just stop. Your kids need to hang out with people their own age. Yeah. Especially not adults. Another thing is like setting boundaries with your kids. Like your kids don't have to hug everybody. They don't have to kiss everybody. Yeah. They don't have to do this. They don't have to like no. Mm-hmm. And if you're if you get that feeling that your kids a little off, let them be off. Like let that. Let, let, my if my daughter walks in. She don't have to hug you. Yeah. Just because like I'm your friend. Yeah. That's not how this works. Um. She don't have to sit on grandpa's lap if she don't want to sit with grandpa. Right. She don't have to sit on his lap or grandma's lap or or whoever. And it's so you just have to be aware of what's happening, and. And and protect your children. I think in my case, I don't think it was a lack of awareness. I think it was just, um, I think for my also for my grandparents, I'll say I had already been through so much shit in my life, and they knew that I had that yeah. they probably just didn't want to step on my toes anymore. Mm. And I and I defended the guy with everything I had. Yeah. So they're like, well, we don't want to yeah. take the one good thing away from him. Exactly. Now, going back to my mom, I think that there's probably some neglect and, and negligence and and things like that. Um, but with that being said too, these guys are very calculated, you know, yeah. and, and they're very strategic. Like this guy that molested me ran a haunted house in his, in his hometown every year, like 4,000 kids would come through his haunted house. And he was at the end handing candy to every single one of them and on main street. Like, and I mean, I, I participated in that house. Like I helped scare the kids and all that. Yeah. So they're very good at getting into the house and and they know what they're looking for. Like there's an interview with a guy that talks about if he saw a kid with a dad, he's not going to yep. go near yeah, him. Yeah, yeah, Nick Nick Freitas made a video about that. Yeah, so talking about how like that was the first thing first thing they look, they for. look for is like is there a dad that's frequently around, yep. looks like he's engaged, is aware. Yep. Because th- dude, there's like an innate Yeah, they're looking for a soft target. I yeah. mean, we it, it's the same thing in the military, <laughs> yeah, right? You're yeah. walking down the street, you got your head down, who's yeah. they going to shoot first? Exactly. So Yeah. Um, that's what they're looking for. And if they find a weakness, they find a way they can tap in and get mm-hmm. into that system. They will. Yeah. I mean, and kids naturally, you know, think the best of people Yeah, because they still have innocence, Yes, <laughs> which is good. And you yeah. want to guard that. I'm not saying take away their innocence, but you have to understand that they're not going to make a logical choice because they're still seeing it through the lens of a child. But, and like, I, I know with, um, with our daughter, we have conversations about like, uh, you know, hey, you know, if someone asks to touch you or something like that, it's it's not okay. It's right. never okay. Like, and and especially if we're not there, like, you know, so even when you go to the doctor or whatever, like, mommy or daddy is with you, and they don't get to do anything without us like being present. Do not let anyone, you know, like we have these. She's she'll be nine this year, so you know, a little bit different now but yeah. I remember my normally I let my wife do it because I think it's more comfortable for our daughter sure. to let my wife right it's a little less yeah troubling but um you know she's been doing that since she was pretty young four Good. or five years old you know Good. and and um and then also always reassuring that like whatever happens you can please always come tell us like you will never be if something happens or you're confused about something that happened you will never be in trouble for coming to us and just trying to understand what happened and, and talk to us and and we will take care of you and protect you. But like we we've done that a lot. I think that stuff goes a long way too in kind of like shielding them from and I and I think that that's the hard line we draw or like have to balance with parents is like you don't wanna you don't wanna force conversations necessarily because then it's like they're not equipped for it yet. But at the same time you kinda have to, you know? And yeah, I think um, I think people don't have the conversation early enough because it does happen to kids that are four, three, four, five years old, mm-hmm. um, and you can see those signs in those kids because they they'll do it. If a three year old is like touching themselves, 
that's a problem. Right. They should not be touching or like trying to do that to other kids. Right. Right. You know? Um, so that's a sign, right? Yeah. Now here's a piece of advice too, um, is when you are telling your kids and, and this is something that you learn when you talk to a lot of people with trauma is, is like not to react. Right. So if you're like, a lot of people are like, well, right. my, if, if somebody touches my daughter, I'm killing them. Yeah. Okay. Well, if you say that in front of your daughter. Yeah. Now she's going to be like, well, I don't want to talk. Yeah. I'm not going to say nothing. Cause like, you're going to kill him. Yeah. You're yeah. going to, you're going to, you know, you're going to fly off the handle. So right. like when somebody's disclosing some, some, some news to you, especially your kids, uh, you have to be very composed. So yeah. it doesn't matter. Like, um, even my, I'll say, I'll tell you this story. My daughter got off the bus and she, uh, she says, Ooh, man, it was really hot. Everybody had red faces except for the black kid. And I could have reacted and like, Oh, ha, 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 it was funny. Cause she, yeah. she's innocent. Right. She doesn't understand yeah, yeah, yeah. like the right. uh, black girl is not going to get a flushed face because right. of her skin color. Right. Yeah. Most people react to that and say, oh, my God, did you just hear what she said? Right, ah, right, right, that's right. so funny. Now you've just put it into that girl's head that it's funny to, like, make fun of, like, this skin color situation. Yeah, or you've, like you've created an this, unhealthy like, narrative. association. Y- yeah. Yes, yeah. So it's the same thing with anything your kids tell you. Mm. If they come to you and they say, Daddy, I'm upset, okay, well, why are you upset? You don't want to be like, why are you upset? Because you're going you're gonna to steer that conversation. Right. They're going to be like, okay, never mind. Yeah, or, in the future they won't want to. Yeah. yeah, man. So you just you just react calm, poker face. Okay, can you tell me more? Mm. And then once you get to like, okay, you have discovered everything. Now you can maybe put some emotion into the conversation, right. and, and you know, even if you're it's something they're proud of, you know. Yeah, Daddy, I did really good on my spelling test. Oh wow! Well, like what happened? Okay, what happened? Okay, that is awesome. I'm yeah, so yeah. proud of you, right? But if you if you you can steer the conversation, and it's just your kids, man. They'll tell you. You just have to understand how to have that conversation. Mm-hmm. So that's a really good piece of advice. I, I definitely, uh, and also kind of like ask, don't jump to conclusions, you know, like if, if, uh, you know, kids say things at school, right. Yeah. And your kid will come home and say something and, and instead of being like really intense about it, ask them like, Hey honey, well, what do you think that means? Yeah. And often, you know, in my head, you know, I think they understand what the thing meant and they clearly don't, you know, yeah. and then they talk through what they think it is. It's like, okay, so that's not what that is. What it really is is this, and this is why we don't say that. Or You know, I mean, yeah, like yeah. that's just one example, but yeah. the temptation to want to, like, nip it in the bud or whatever yeah. really hard is is real. But yeah. um, really good piece of advice there to, to kind of keep the, the poker face, the stoicism up front to make yeah. sure that you condition, like, hey, it's okay to bring it to me. Mm-hmm. Um, man, there's so much to, like – revisit and and try and extract from your experience um as it relates to men right i think most like most guys probably hear your story and they think like wow how do you hold it together like how do you feel like a man you know right because it's a very brutally emasculating experience right um And I think there's a crisis of masculinity today. Like, I think most men, like, don't even know what it means to be a man anymore, right? Um, We don't have rites of passage. We're all confused about what gender we are and all this kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. So, you know, what what are the things that have grounded you in who you are, what your identity really is, what your legacy is going to be, all these types of kind of masculine things we typically rely upon for our identity, right? Because that could have gone very negative for you. And I think there's a lot to learn from how you've been able to redefine who you are, repurpose yourself and be confident in leading your family that you have today, despite everything. Right. And I think every man can learn from that. Yeah, man. I I think, um, I had a positive, I did have a positive influence in my life. And that was Jacob who I talked about in the story. Right. He was older. And there were times where like, I kind of, there was times where like I was kind of screwing around a little bit too much mm. and I was getting real hateful with my grandparents and my grandparents gave me everything I, I needed and, and deserved. And, um, like one day he took me to the last house I lived in with my mom, the house that had the hole in the ceiling and yeah. all this stuff, you know, and he just parked in front of the house, didn't say a word. And I just cried. Mm. And, um, and he was a hard, he was hard on me. And I think to your point, this lack of masculinity or like this lack of like, we don't know who we are. Yeah. It's because we don't have these, these guys that are holding people accountable. Mm-hmm. Like 
you know, you're overweight or you're being a dumbass or you're, you're making, you know, whatever, like you need to do better. Yeah. We don't have that. It's more it, like, it's so soft and, and, and you have to be like, you have to hurt somebody's feelings sometimes. Yeah. And, and that's one thing I'll say about this Jacob guy I talk about is he was very tough on me and he told me straight up, he's like, you're being a dumbass. Mm. And if you keep doing what you're doing, do you want to be back here? Like, do you want to be living in this place again mm. when you're older? And it was tough, man. And that that was like 16 when he did that. I was like 16 or 17. Like this was like a year or two within reporting the guy mm. after dealing with all this crap in my life. Yeah, he didn't baby you. He wasn't like, still... yeah, you know. And, and and so with that and with everything that happened to me, one of the things that I realized there are certainly a lot of people that care, right? But it, they care about as much as they do about our soldiers that are deployed, right? Everybody cares about them on like three days of the year. Yeah. And the rest of the time, they don't know what the hell is happening. Mm-hmm. Um, they're oblivious. And and so your problems, they don't care. Yeah. They don't care. So uh, when shit happens to you, what are you going to do about it? Right. And, and when he told me that, it's like, Nobody cares. Like, nobody's going to hold your hand. I can't walk into, like, some corporate office and be like, hey, man, I was molested for, like, yeah. five and a half years. I've had a really hard life. I need a raise or hey, I need I, a job. Yeah. Can you please just give me this job? I had a, I had a tough right. life. They're going to be like, no. Yeah. You know, so, like, th- sorry that happened to you, but we need something more than that. Right. So that's something I realized young. And even despite realizing that, I still – used my victim mentality for a long time. Mm. Um, and I, I'll go back to this. I read extreme ownership. Yeah. And that's, that's honest to God. Like that's what, that's what grounded me. Like when, okay. before I read that, I'm telling you, man, before I read extreme ownership, I was like a victim blaming person. I was like, I didn't have a dad and I went through all this right. and you don't know me and you don't know what I've been through and like, mm. screw you and blah, blah, blah. Like I'm, I'm tougher than all of you. And you people don't even know who the hell I am. Yeah. And it's like, Nobody gives a shit who you are. Right. Like, get over yourself. You know, you had a hard day. Guess what? So did this guy. Yeah. And, and you know, what are you going to do about it? So if you get bit by the snake, are you going to go look for the freaking snake or are you going to go to the damn hospital and get right. some freaking help? Right, and get you the know? antivenom, yeah. Yeah, you know. <laughs> so, so, that's a good point. Yeah, that's kind of what grounded me was, like, honestly, reading that book. And I've read a few others since yeah. then. I've got a handful of books that I'd recommend that are good for mentality and 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 things like that. Um, Tim Grover's like Relentless is another yeah. great freaking book um, that just there there is as a man I did not have a father in my life and so like I knew that when I became a husband and a father like I knew that it's my time to like change my generation yeah. like this Gale name that has been cursed for so long it's it stops with me right from here on out we're we're doing the right freaking thing yeah and and my name will be represented in in a, in a positive light when you look up my name i don't want you to see the the prison records and right. the and the and the trashy stuff on on social media i want you to see this positive influence yeah i want my kids to 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 look at back in 15 years and look back and be like damn my dad was a freaking badass yeah and and i you know not i might not be a war hero i might not be an olympic athlete but I went through a lot of shit in my life, yeah. and to come out on the other end and to be the person that I am, and never been addicted to drugs, never been an alcoholic, um, to run ultra marathons, to do like all these like other hard things, a combat deployment. Um, when people look at me, I am the anomaly. I am the exception. Yeah. I am the one that stands out. That's like holy shit. Yeah, you beat the odds. I beat the, I beat all the yeah. odds, you know. And and as a man, you know that's that's. To your point, too, with like this, like the the gender thing. I just spoke at the largest school district in Georgia Thursday, and and three of the speakers that were there were talking about this um, because there are books in the schools that are like basically promoting it. Yeah. And and you know now there was just recently there was a transgender kid who threatened to shoot up a school, right? And I'm not I don't know if it was because he's trans or not. I don't yeah. I don't know, but it what happened to me will make you question yourself. Okay. Uh, yeah. Right? Certainly. And it makes you like wonder, like, because when I was in school, I made those threats. I, I threatened to shoot up, uh, shoot one of my teachers. I threatened to uh, do bad things in school. Yeah. And fortunately enough, I had a few people in my life that that stuck their necks out for me. And mm. I've gone back to 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 cry on that man's shoulder as my wrestling coach. I cried on his shoulder for thirty minutes because he saved my life. Mm. But I had threatened to shoot another teacher basically um, via Facebook, and. Um, thankfully I got the very minimal like sentence. I got, I went to alternative school for like a week or two, Okay, but 
like think about that when those kids are making those threats and those kids are like doing this like weird one off things or yeah. maybe going into this like trans thing. Why are they doing that? Yeah. Why are they looking for this escape of who they are? Something probably happened to them. Yeah. And if we don't like punish people in the right way, the right manner, and, and like for example, like a death penalty or or, or something um, for like pedophiles or, or or stuff like that, these people are going to continue to do it because there's virtually no punishment. Right. And then the kids are screwed. I mean, like I said, man, this guy abused. Yeah. It's it's lifelong. Yeah. It's a lifelong wound now that you forever yep. have to. You have to use the tools of of healing and and you know wellness to oh, man, to yeah. practice daily. You know we all have our thing, right? Yep. Like you know I've I've got my stuff where every day I got to wake up and be like, okay, that's not me today, and I'm yep. not going to do that today. You know, and but yeah, the, yours was thrust upon you by you know, you know yeah. yeah when you were vulnerable and uh, yeah it, yeah the the. The sentence does not match the crime. And and with that, uh, one a piece of a big piece of advice I give to a lot of people, right, is that like I said, don't go looking for the snake. Okay, mm-hmm. if you report or if you're an alcohol uh, alcoholic or you're addicted to drugs or you're X Y whatever the hell your problem is, yeah, you don't go and like don't go and look for the vindication or like the uh, the justice, right? Yeah. Do it for yourself. If right. that person gets punished, then great. Right, but if they don't, because sometimes they don't, what are you going to do about it? Like, right. are you going to sit around and, and cry? Because uh, that's what people do, right? Yeah. They fall apart, they get addicted to drugs, they start drinking, they just ruin their whole lives because like they didn't get the justice that they think think they deserved. Yeah, that's being the part of the community that I am of a child sexual victim or whatever. A lot of the people that I speak to or like a lot of the organizations, they're very like get your justice mm. and speak your mm. voice. They they have this like. You're still a victim at that point. Yeah, you're still a victim, man. It's like, like you need something to happen. It, it, you're, you're making someone else responsible for your happiness. It's codependency. Yeah, and, and it's like, look, don't worry about the, don't worry about the, uh, the punishment of that person. There are ways we can work around this, and like they, they do need to be punished. Yes, but sometimes people fall through the cracks. Sometimes yeah. people rob banks and they go, they get out. All right, it happens. Yeah. What does the bank do? The bank doesn't like chase this guy down for ten years. They just keep moving on, and it's a little, maybe it's a little bit different, but. Nonetheless, I don't, I don't, I never looked for the justice. I never seeked the justice. I I was never mad that the guy only got 10 years. Um, I just moved on. Yeah. And, and, and so what's, what I've done now is I'm, I'm healing myself by talking, telling my story, helping other people heal. So that's what I tell people now is like, don't report just to get justice. Cause now when you report, it's like mandatory that you get certain treatment and therapy. And when you get that therapy, uh, you're taking all that weight off your back, and you're and you're able to heal. Because even if that person gets 50 years and they're they get tortured mm-hmm. forever for the rest of their lives, yeah. if you never healed, then what's the what does it matter? You're still you're still yeah. stuck. So so you have to report if you're a veteran, you're dealing with suicide or 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 uh, depression or divorce or whatever your situation is. Talk about Nick, right? Yeah. I mean, Nick could have Nick could have freaking sat in that damn hospital and just cried his life away. Yeah, because he lost his leg. Because he lost his yeah. leg, right? And it, it, so, like, when you hear somebody's story like that, too, it, it has nothing to do with me. But it's so relatable because yeah. Nick can be like, man, this guy shot me and now my whole life's ruined. And I'm just like, now I'm just going to go home and, and, and be this crippled, like, man. Yeah. And it's like, you know what, dude? Like, <laughs> like I, the cards are still in my hand and I'm still playing right. this game. Like, it's not over for me. Yeah. You know? And that's how I feel. I'm 29 years old. And, I, you know, I'll tell you this real quick. I just talked to another school district on Monday, and after I got done speaking, a guy who was 49 years old approached me after the meeting, right? And mm-hmm. this guy's talking to me for about 15 minutes. He's like, I know what you went through personally because I, I know, I know what, that, what that's like. And he's kind of alluding to, to kind yeah. of, you know, he wasn't saying it straight up. We talked for about 15 more minutes, and then he kind of tells me a little bit more details. I'm like, wow, like, that's incredible, man. Like, I'm, and I'm happy for you, and I'm, I'm, I hope you're yeah. doing okay, and I'm glad that you're able to share that with me. Mm-hmm. And then he says to me something that's incredibly powerful, which was, you know, you're probably the first person that I've ever said this to. And he's 49 years old. Yeah. Imagine carrying around that weight for 49 years or 50 or uh, 40 years or however old it was, right? Sure. Imagine carrying around that weight for that long. 
just unpack your bag, man. Mm-hmm. Like that's that's the beautiful thing about a podcast. Yeah. Or or just having friends or just being able to talk. Just unpack your bag because right. that shit's gonna get too heavy, and if it falls apart on you, everybody's gonna see your shit. Mm-hmm. You know, you're gonna end up killing somebody or killing yourself or murdering your family or like do just yeah. crazy things happen because guys and women we just everything gets bottled up and we don't want to talk yeah and when you do talk what's crazy is you'll find more people will be like holy shit like you're really brave and i'm dealing with the same thing yeah 100 percent. i mean vul- vulnerability about what's happened to us and and what we're struggling with is as far as i'm concerned the only way forward because yeah. this act of i got it all figured out i'm I'm, you know, whatever, whatever ideal thing you're trying to be, which is good. Strive to be the ideal thing, but understanding you'll never, we'll never be perfect. You'll never arrive, right? Mm-hmm. There's no such thing as arriving. That's, that's a false mm-hmm. notion. Mm-hmm. Um, but through that vulnerability, yeah, it's, it's very self-serving. It, it takes care of number one, which is a great, that's a good thing. You have to take care of yourself, <laughs> especially with trauma. You got to heal yourself. <laughs> it's not selfishness. It's called self-care. Um, but then it pours out to others, right? It gives others permission to not be perfect. Yeah. And I have talked with so many people through this podcast and like counseling and all that kind of stuff. I've just heard so many stories of serious trauma that like, how can you not be better afterward? Like it's impossible to hear those things and to like share those things on the human level, connecting with someone and not have it improve your life. Like you, if you have a heart beating, it you're gonna mm-hmm. be impacted positively. So, I appreciate you very much for having the courage to do that, especially with something as visceral as what you've been through. And you know the way that shame and embarrassment and all those things swirl around that um, is a very challenging thing. And I know statistically, right, most people never speak out. They never. One in ten. They never. So only one in ten actually report, right? Yep. So ninety percent of victims. Stay silent. Yep. And, I mean, I'm not here to pass any judgment because I can only imagine what that weight must feel like. But clearly, staying silent isn't helping anyone. So thank you for having the courage to do that and being very transparent about it. I'd like to shift real quick in the last couple minutes here. Tell us about what the future looks like for you. Where can people find you and say, you know, follow you, stay supported with you and and uh, track your, I'm sure, very bright future. Yeah, oh, yeah. hopefully. Yeah, um, future is continuing to share my story, speaking, um, podcasts. I'm writing a book. My book should be done September, October time frame. Okay. Um, so that my book tentatively is Strength Beyond the Shadows. I'll have some marketing graphics and an official title in the next six weeks or so. Um, and when that's out, I'll really start pushing that. Um, so, yeah, book, speaking, telling my story. I'm trying to get to as many school districts, anybody who will listen, really. Mm-hmm. My, my story can be impactful on many different levels. The organization, like a work yeah. organization, schools, um, churches, you know, when somebody hears my story, almost every single time there's, there's at least one person in the crowd um, who comes to me afterwards and says, same thing happened to me. Yeah. Thank you so much for sharing it. I have a link on my Instagram that just all these like testimonials of all these people that have like just my stories impacted them. Yeah. And it's, um, uh, it's a very, you know, so, so I, I do, when I do speak, it's very impactful. I spoke at a school recently and spoke to 45 students and six of them came up to me crying afterwards because they were like, they needed help. Yeah. And, um, so the story is there and it's, it's very impactful and the way I tell it, it does help others heal. So that's what I'm doing now. Um, and then, uh, I'll be speaking at the Georgia, um, Children's Hope and Healing Center in Georgia, their annual gala. They're like 40th annual gala okay. in August. I'll be their keynote there. And, That's um, awesome. yeah, man, that'll be like my first like real big event that I've booked, which is really, really cool. I think we're looking at maybe 300 people or so. Um, so I can't wait to tell my story and yeah. like, and, and what that organization, what they do is they help kids from the ages of three to 17 recover from those, that trauma, it's all free Mm -hmm. therapy Mm -hmm. for them. 
That's um, amazing. Yeah. So I'm, I'm looking forward to like raising money for that event and, yeah. and speaking there and helping them. Um, and then in the future is just, you know, just keep, just keep sharing my story and, and, my, I'm on Instagram, YouTube, Facebook, LinkedIn, Seth Gale. And if you type in Seth Gale, you'll find me. My Instagram and YouTube is like go beyond the shadows. Yeah. Um, and uh, you can find a lot of my stuff there. And uh, running ultra marathons, competing in <laughs> jiu-jitsu. So that's that's what I'm doing. Yeah. Um, any final words of advice or thoughts? Just anything you wanted to, to close on? Uh, I just think what you guys are doing is awesome, man. Like I, I think the present father is, is so important in America today. Yeah. Like we, I love America. I'm a, I'm a red blooded American. I, I have no like doubts of this country. Um, but I, I do think that we are lacking fatherhood. I think we're lacking this, this man presence. And I think for several reasons, um, but I think that a lot of the problems that we have in America, America can be solved in the house. Yeah, it, it's all in the families. I agree. It, that's where it, it's those are the roots of America is in the is in the the American household. Yeah, and and without a father, it's very hard for that to happen. So, if you are a household without a father, or even without a mother, um, you need to find those resources outside of that. Whether mm-hmm. it's a jujitsu gym. Or, or a uh, wrestling program or some sort of program yeah. with strong men there, like strong men who can lead others yeah. because that's what kids need. Yep. Even as a single mother, you don't have to be mom and dad. As a single mother, go find those yeah. fa- go find those figures in the community that your kids can look up to yep. and that you can trust. I, I know a single mother who her son just turned 18, and for a very long time she's had him involved in – groups that have yeah. very strong male role models, you know, and, and I've, you know, I, I don't know him that well, but I, he carries himself in a way that I definitely did not carry myself when I was 18. So it, you know, yeah, he didn't have his dad around, but clearly that has played a huge positive role in his life, you know, cause you, you wouldn't think he's 18 when you talk to him, yeah. you know, <laughs> the way he carries himself. So that, that's a huge thing too. I don't want to, disparage any you know whatever your situation is um you know we're not advocating to like talk down on anyone the ideal is that both mom and dad are home right that's that's we all want to strive for the ideal i also realize that for half the country that's not a reality Mm -hmm. um so to do the best you with what you got right and um to your point too earlier about like extreme ownership the book itself but also the concept that um I personally believe that it's not just the father not being there, but it's the fact that most men, and I was one of them. I mean, I've only recently been on this journey where I've, I've really leaned into owning my stuff. We live in the world now where it's easier than it's ever been to, you know, run from your problems or to, to, to look good, but not really be good. Right. To appear like you're doing good, but you're really doing evil or to pass the buck. And I think it really, for the most part, starts with men. Most of the damage that you see, most single mothers are single mothers because there was a flawed man in the equation at some point, right? Either her dad or whatever. And I'm not, I don't want to, I don't want to paint everyone with the same brush, right? There's numerous situations, but I think a lot of those problems get solved by when guys take ownership of themselves and start stepping up in in your own life. Lead yourself first, and then just watch the other stuff trickle down mm-hmm. from there. Yeah, man. Yeah, I think you guys are doing a great job. Um, just, bringing, well, thank you. Yeah, bringing that awareness and that 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 you know we need more strong men in the world. Yeah, and and to, and those strong men to lead other men. And don't ever I always tell everybody once you get where you're going, don't ever forget where you came from. You know, and and reach back and there's people that need help and you're helping them. You know, just by doing this. Yeah. You know. So. Thank you. Yeah, man. Well, Seth, it's. Uh... Uh, man, I'm I'm still just like processing everything yeah. I've heard and learned, and I I just can't thank you enough for having the courage to do this. Um, I hope nothing but the best for you. We'll definitely be staying in touch and watching your journey as you continue to grow in your speaking career and changing yeah. lives. And um, you know, to those listening to this, uh, again, do not discount your experiences. Don't look down on yourself because you haven't had as much trauma, quote unquote. Take the lessons out of what Seth's talking about. Use his example and apply it in whatever way you can to your situation 
and together we'll all just get that much better and that's all we can hope for so thank you so much brother wish you nothing but the best and uh with that dads let's get climbing that mountain we will see you in the next episode Thanks for watching this episode of the podcast. If you're on YouTube, drop a subscription to us. And if you are listening on Apple or Spotify, please leave us a review. It helps greatly. If you are also ready to level up as a man, check out Elite Sentinel Coaching, our program designed specifically for men, where we forge men into leaders. We turn cowards into kings, weaklings into warriors. Become the hero in your story. Join us today.